All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to Bring the Juice. I'm your host, Frank Delana, today on the pod. We got a lot of grit, a lot of Valley grit. I got Fresno State Bulldog, a lot of other things. Cam, we're well. Cam, this is overdue. Welcome yeah. to Bring the Juice, brother. First we gonna rock, then we gonna fall, then we let it pop, don't let it go. Man, finally. finally. We've been talking about it for a while. Schedules haven't worked out, but man, happy to be here. Here we are. I appreciate you coming. Yeah. Uh, I just got to come out of the gate being a Valley guy. I just want to say the word Chowchilla, mm. okay? Mm. Chowchilla. Growing up in Chowchilla, was it always the dogs? Was it always I got to play at Fresno State? Talk to me about just growing up in Chowchilla, playing ball, and then your first journey of getting to Fresno State. Yeah, it was playing a, it was playing basketball at Fresno State. That was the dream, honestly. Like my grandpa and uncle had season tickets to sell in Arena. So I heard that's crazy. I didn't go to my first football game, Fresno State football game, until I was like in eighth grade. I didn't really play football growing up. I didn't really care about it. So I was a basketball player, man. I played baseball, I played basketball. So I would go to four or five Fresno State basketball games at Sell and Arena and they were live. I heard Live. I heard it was insane. It was, it was, man. You think about the atmosphere that is starting to build around Fresno State football now. And it was there in the early 2000s when I was playing. Like, we were sold out. Right. Student section was packed. Like, the atmosphere that exists in Bulldog Stadium now, or Valley Children's Stadium, Sal Arena was sold out every single game. Yeah. It was loud every single game. And I experienced that for as long back as I can remember. So... Man, I loved loved Fresno State. Right. Loved Fresno State. Always went to games. I was a big Tark fan. UNLV mm-hmm. was they were in the the heyday of Tark at UNLV during you know my teen years. So I was a huge fan. So yeah, I always loved Fresno State. Wanted to play basketball, uh, and then kind of just it really just kind of lucked into football. I had a JV baseball coach who became the varsity football coach at Chowchilla, recruited me to play football, Love and that. <laughs> and, and kind of tricked me into playing football. Honestly, and I don't know the rest is history. It was just a game that fit me. Like I played, I was a little bit of a football player on the basketball court. Yeah, right, physical. Totally. Sure. And football, you, you're, you're celebrated when you're physical. You run as fast as you can into somebody and hit them as hard as you possibly can. Uh-huh. And people cheer for that. So at that time in my life, it was perfect, man. It was a great outlet for all the rage and violence that I had going on at 16, 17 years old. And yeah. luckily, Pat Hill, year two here, you know, offered me a walk on spot. I had no real offers at all. And it, it was perfect. You talk, so wait, when did, what was your first year of actual playing like tackle football then? I played a couple years of Pop Warner, but I was okay. really bad. <laughs> uh, so my first year in high school was my junior junior year. You didn't play freshman yeah. sophomore year? No, I didn't play till I was a junior. No yeah. shit. And I didn't start until like halfway through the season. We had like two running backs get hurt. Mm-hmm. So I started, ran for 105 or something, and the rest was kind of history. Worked yeah. really hard that off season. Had a really good senior year. Just I was... I was raw. Like I didn't understand football. I didn't play I defense. It. I played corner a little bit, but really I was just a running back. So in high school, you only played running back? Mainly? Only played running back. I played a couple games of corner. I played one, my last game, my senior year, I played safety. And it was really like, I got recruited more off of that game at safety than I did any other game in my career. Cause guys were like, why don't you play this position all the time? Yeah. I was like, I don't know. I was carrying the ball 25 times a game. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I didn't go both ways. I was a returner. So they, they tried to kind of hold me and, and, and be an offensive weapon. Was it weird? I asked this because I, I'm opposite. When I was a sophomore, I only played defense. And then they said, like, you're never going to play offense for me. <laughs> and I'm like... You know Anthony Ghostin? He's like, you're never going to play offense for me. I need someone to play corner. And at the time, I practiced all sophomore year on JV, balling out a wide receiver. And I'm like, okay, shit. Like, I guess I'm calling up because I'm playing good. We played Edison in the scrimmage. I had like three little touchdowns. The guy's like, who's this white boy, all right? And I'm like, okay, let's go. I'm getting called up. Great. 115 pounds, five foot four, right? <laughs> and um, he goes, I need you to play corner for me. And I'm like, dude. I don't even, I never even played corner before. I played a little bit JV. Come yeah, on. JV yeah. Break. And uh, <laughs> sure enough, I'm I'm all this sh- all these great experiences of playing high school football. I go and play offense in college. 
So when you found out that they wanted you to play defense in college, were you kind of like, hey, I don't have that much experience there yet? Or like, what, what was the vibe? What was the vibe? I came here as a running back. You so I, I was recruited as a running back. Uh-huh. And probably the first maybe week, maybe four or five practices my freshman year, I was a running back. But right. uh, I got here with Derek Ward, who – played seven or eight years in the NFL which would have would have been one of the all-time great Bulldogs had he not had some academic issues sure. uh Josh Levi who was a you know highly touted recruit from down south Paris Gaines was here Michael Pittman had just left so I'm looking at all these guys who are playing the running back position and I was watching what was going on and I thought you know what like I would rather hit yeah. people than be hit by the types of people that I see making contact. Cause you know, I was 185 pounds coming out of high school and right. didn't think that I ever had a future as a running back. I would have been okay. If I would have stuck with it, I'd have been okay. Sure. You know, I would, I would have played, I'm sure I ran hard. I, I was shifty. Um, but it took about four, four days and then I moved to corner. Hmm. So I was a corner for a couple weeks and then moved to safety and the safety was just kind of the fit. I, I like to hit and, Kevin Coyle was here at the time who wow. really liked the way that I approached playing the safe position. I was just raw. So red shirted came in at about 182 by, you know, when we red shirted that freshman year, we, we wouldn't meet, we would go work out. So we were working out like five days a week. So yeah. from when we reported in August to like midway through the season, I went from like 182 to like 210. Oh, wow. And they were like, how, how big do you think you can who get? Who was your strength coach? Steve Sabonia. Oh, my yeah, guy. Yeah, Steve Sabonia. Yeah. Rest in peace, man. Yeah, totally, man. He was my trainer my whole NFL career. Yeah, he, he, he was, was the my man. Tra- he's the only yeah. reason I got to Fresno yeah. State. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was the man. Um, so he was just grinding us in the weight yeah. room. So I got up to 210, and Coyle was like, you think you can get to 225 and play Will Linebacker? And I was like, I don't know. I'll try. So I got up to about 215, and they were like, no, nah, let's let's just keep you at safety. So yeah. redshirted. Didn't play my my redshirt freshman year and then flunked out. <laughs> Had yeah. to go to Fresno City, which was really, I mean, the the most important year of my adult life. Mm-hmm. You know, without that year, no success, really. Just totally humbling. I, I had beaten out a returning all-wax safety my sophomore year. I was going to start at Ohio State. Like, that's what I was lined up to do and didn't take care of the classroom work. So, wasn't eligible, went to Fresno City, played one season. We went 10-0. It was a great season. But Tony Cavillia, who's still the head coach there, like he, there's no sugarcoating. You know, like this is why you're here, and these are the things you need to do to get out of here. Right. If you do them, you can get out of here. If you don't, you're never getting out. Like all the possibilities of your football career are done if you don't handle the business that you have to take care of. And like I said, that was the most – um educational growth year right. of my entire adult life. And I think coach C to this day for the, the lessons that he taught me during that year. When you're, and I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking from my personal experience, like when you're a walk on, you just get the opportunity. And I mean, Cam, I don't know how to tell you this. Like it's hard to make D one. Did you feel like you were, you, you trusted, you doubled down on yourself to say, Hey, I have this D one opportunity. I'm going to go to JC there's guys who do that and they never come back. Yeah. What what was your and I'm sure it was all business, but what was your approach saying, "Hey, I'm going to leave Fresno State and 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 go make this Fresno City decision to to, to ultimately get back?" Yeah. I mean, there, I really had no choice. There was yeah. no like I was ineligible to play Division 1 football. Oh, okay. Right? So I couldn't like I was a starter and I was ineligible. Like that's what it can Kevin Coyle Dro- drove me from Fresno to my dad's apartment in Chowchilla to meet with myself and my dad to try to figure out if there were anything we could do for me to become eligible that fall. And we couldn't. Like, I was too far behind um, to to make those classes up. But I mean, he, he tried so hard. Right. Like, he was such a – he was always in my corner. That's why, I mean, I love him to this day. But he, he literally drove me from Fresno to Chowchilla to try to to try to help Figure me out. 
uh, and it just didn't work out and I had no real option. And my, my grandfather was friends with Bill Waite, who was a tennis coach at Fresno City. Somehow he found out I was ineligible and Coach C called me and was like, hey, I heard you're ineligible. Like, come check us out and see right. what we're about. And I thought, oh man, you know, it's kind of like I'm getting recruited by a junior college, right? So I walked into Coach C's office and it was like, uh, look man, if you come here, it's not easy. We, we, this is a hard program to stay in. Uh, we have academic standards. If you're not going to live up to them, don't come. Right. If you do, I'll help you get back on the road to being a division one football player, but you have to do, you have to do the hard work. If you're not going to do the hard work, don't come. And I was like, okay, this is what I need. Right. You know, this is what I need. And it was honestly the best year of my, I would not have gone back to Fresno State, which that was the goal. I got recruited by other schools, you know, UCLA. I talked to them quite a bit, but it, I, I was going back to Fresno State. That was the goal. I was right. getting back and I was taking what I had earned the first time and gave up. I was taking that back. Before we continue on that, got to give a quick shout out to our, one of our sponsors at FFB Bank. Whether your business needs a loan or your dream needs a savings plan, FFB offers the guidance and flexibility you need to flourish. Checking and savings, SBA loans, long-term investment options, everything you'll ever need from a banking partner you'll find at FFB Bank. What makes them different is their passion for knowing you beyond your financial statements, listening to your needs, and fostering mutual growth by linking their success to yours. FFP Bank, you walk in there, they give you a nice handshake at Go Dogs. Uh, hey, did you listen to last week at Bring the Juice? They're really personal in there, and I appreciate that. That's why we bank with them at Bring the Juice and all small businesses of the Valley, beyond the Valley. There used to be called Fresno First Bank. They had to get rid of that name because they're becoming national brand. The same way Bring the Juice is becoming national brand, so we're working hand in hand together. Iron sharpens iron. Shout out to FFP Bank. I feel like a good ad read. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. Um, no, but Kim, I mean, like, that's a. There had to be some like dark, dark <laughs> thoughts going through that whole era. There were there were dark times for sure. What did you and and, and, and like I bring this up because like I think everyone every human being has their own vice. Whether it could look like they have a perfect life, trust me, shit ain't always pretty. Uh, it could look like they're obviously maybe they're not that great and they're not and just you could see it a little more on the outside but i think you know especially athletes you go through so much adversity whether it's between uh you know injuries just things not going your way necessarily they bring in someone else the that, that coaching staff recruited them so they're getting a little bit of an advantage um, we'll get into how you went undrafted obviously a first round draft pick is going to have more more uh, leeway to, to to f up basically than an undrafted guy trying to make the 53 you're faced with these adversities and it sounds like that that year at city you face some demons what did you do to basically say like, hey i need to click something in my head to get back to d1 like what was the what was the mental part because i i understand that you know i understand the game plan yeah, like the physical part was taken care of. It's like I had a great spring. I really beat out an all-wax safety. Was like I said, was going to start the horseshoe Ohio right. State as a sophomore. Like it was a big deal. Right. I had done all the work physically, but I just I wasn't responsible enough as an adult to handle my business. Like that was it. I wouldn't wake up early to go to class. I wouldn't study. I wouldn't do a science. Like literally it's not that difficult to right. do right but you have to be responsible you have to understand that you can't just excel in one area of your life you have to excel in all areas of your life you have to put effort into everything that you do if you're going to have success in any portion of your life like they're they're not disassociated no. right you can't be an excellent football player and not put the same effort into the classroom or at least put in enough effort to do the the minimum, which sometimes the minimum's enough, right? And I didn't even do the minimum. So, right. you know, didn't have to work necessarily hard in the classroom at Chowchilla to be like a 3.0 student. So I didn't really have any study skills. I was not responsible. I should not have lived on my own at 18 years old. Like I graduated on Friday. I lived on my own on Monday. Like I was out. 
from Chowchilla <laughs> to Fresno. Like it just, I was not responsible enough to handle um, <clears throat> the responsibilities of being a, a college athlete. Right. And that, that's what it came down to. I was not able to, to self-motivate enough. I knew what was at stake and I still wouldn't take care of business. So it, I had to be humbled basically. Right. Like you're, you're going to lose everything that you've worked for. You're going to lose every potential opportunity as a football player that you have. If you don't start being a responsible adult and that slap in the face when you're, man, I'm going to start at the horseshoe versus Ohio state to I'm a backup at Fresno city because I just got there a week before camp started and they've been working out for four months. Like you don't just walk in cause you were at Fresno state and start in that program. That's not how it works. No. So, you know, like I said, best, that's a tough, best experience that, that, that I had as a irresponsible young adult to becoming a responsible adult. I'm just visually like a car wash for some reason. I like you came in, not dirty. I'm not going to say dirty, but like you came in with certain things Fresno City was your car wash, and you came out. Yeah. And you came out, though, and you pulled that that nice Mercedes <laughs> right into Fresno State. And so talk to me about the second the second time at Fresno State. Yeah. What, was, what was your second first day like? <laughs> Pat, Pat Hill made me, he made me walk on again, right? He didn't offer me a scholarship, but it took me about a week and a half into training camp, and and he offered me a scholarship. So he, But he made me work for it, right? Good. He made me show, right? He made me show, hey... You did it at Fresno City. You right. took care of your academics. Okay, that was the minimum that you had to do. Right. Now, what are you going to do when you step on this football field? How are you going to work over the summer? Is that going to translate to the season? And it did. Like, I was ready to go, man. Right. I was motivated. I I had worked with – we had a great – and that was 2001. That was, you know, four games in, Dave Carr's on the cover of Sports Illustrated, right? Year. We knew that we had all of this talent, and most of that talent had been building for mm -hmm. years. So – like I was ready to go. I was, I was disciplined. I took care of everything. You know, I understood the the playbook. Everything I needed to do, I did at a high level. And about a week and a half in, get offered a scholarship, which is great because I was poor. <laughs> you know, like even back then, five hundred twenty nine bucks a month was a lot right. to me at that time. So it was a huge weight lifted off my shoulders. And then I was just able to to ball. Right. You know, then I was just able to play football and didn't start my junior year. Probably should have. Um, Talk to JD about that. JD Williams, who was the, the DB coach at the time back then, but you know, played a lot, played in the nickel packages, played a lot of special teams, had a lot of positive plays. Uh, and that 2001 season was fantastic. You know, we should have finished it off. We didn't. Uh, but then, you know, he, Pat Hill used to sit us down at the end of every season with every single coach on the other side trainers, you know, strength and conditioning, every assistant coach who has any input with you at all. And it's, there's nothing held back and it was basically like you, you know you had a good junior year but here are all the things that you don't do well like and it was and we had bryce mcgill as a starter and then you're here and every other safety's hunting for your job and i was like all right i, I get what's going on right so, and that so that was another kind of wake up call like all right it's time to step up what i did last year and become a leader right and became a leader had a good senior year all whack you know over 100 tackles five picks took him to the house took all of the things that that had been taught to me that were hard to get through really absorbed all of them that year and and played like the leader of a of a unit that's awesome that's fucking awesome <laughs> no i mean it's cool because like i I know it's not easy and it's, and, and I could say that on a podcast, but like, it really isn't easy. Like you, you can't, you know, a 45 minute to an hour podcast can't describe like the demons you face of facing that adversity, whatever it might be, like I said, and for you to have to get just to get there. Cause I'm thinking of the, the cam and chow chilla. Who's like, dude, I just want to kind of, I want to play ball. Yeah. You yep. get your shot. You get to the point where it's like, Hey, it's in front of me. It gets taken away, and again, all you could do is control the controllable. You had the maturity to say, like, it, it was my ass. Like at the end of the day, you get it to go into a program like Fresno City, which is a respected ass junior college, mm -hmm. by the way. Go through the gauntlet, come back, Coach Hill, toughest nails, gets you in the, basically just primes you to polish you, 
and have this breakout senior season. You have some great, you know, moments in that 2001 year as well. And like, it's tough because like you just like ripped off, you know, like a couple of statistics, which congratulations, by the way. But I'm saying, <laughs> you know, people don't see the the other parts of it necessarily and like the the growth part of like that 2001 you're like yeah maybe you are running down on kickoff instead of being the starting safety necessarily like okay all right own your role figure it out find a fucking way which you did and it kind of leads me into asking the next question of every piece of the journey we've talked about so far you found a way adversity struck you figure it out you find a way sometimes it takes more time than others but fresno state's over and you got NFL, you know, on your mind. Talk to me about becoming undrafted yet making the 53 for the Bears. Man. What was the mindset? Like, okay, you, you did pro day. Yeah. And then it's like, wh- what happened? What was your yeah. journey? What was your journey? Yeah, I did I did pro day. We had a couple of pro days back then. And uh, I, I ran okay. Uh, worked out well. Everything else was good. I just, I wasn't a track guy, right? So I didn't really know how to run. So, uh, low four, six, high four, five, which is decent as a safety. Uh, film was good. I talked to, there were three days of the draft back then. I talked to four teams the morning before that third day, which I think the third day was rounds four through seven, right? Yeah, it's, so it's four, still that, isn't it? Four, five, six, seven. Oh, it is. It is again now. Cause they have the, okay. the Thursday night round one yes. and then round two. Yeah. So it one, used to be two, three. Yeah. W- yeah. One, two, four, five, six, seven. Right, right. Right. Um, so I talked to the bears, the dolphins, the Bengals, the 49ers, all four of those teams, the morning before the draft started, every two, a team, every single team told me you're on our draft board. If we don't draft you, we're going to call you towards the end of the draft. Cause we'll probably sign you as an undrafted free agent, right? That was four conversations the morning of the draft. Yes. Four rounds go through. It gets towards the end of the draft. My phone doesn't ring. The draft ends. My phone doesn't ring. Do you have a draft party? Yeah, small draft party. I did have a small <laughs> draft party. Yes, you at my brother's to, house. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. yeah, like I thought I was, I thought I was gonna, like I, I had talked to these teams consistently throughout right. the process, right? right? So I, I thought I had a good idea of where I was. Didn't hear from anybody the whole night. No team, my agent, nothing, nothing. Like I'm absolutely devastated, yeah. right? Devastated, like my career's over. This is. I like I went I was so excited to be drafted or at least get a call and sign as an undrafted free agent to right. like not even getting an opportunity. So it wasn't until the very next day. Like how was sleep that night? Not at all. I mean it was I I was devastated. Like I was completely my world was was over. Like yeah. everything that I had worked for, everything for you know, from the end of the season to April. Like I had one thing on my mind and that was become an NFL football player. Right. Gone. Yeah. So the next morning I get a call from Marty Barrett, who was a regional scout with the bears. He's now like head of, I think he's head of college recruiting for the Rams. Um, but been in, been in the game forever. Um, Hey man, I really, really fought hard for you. Couldn't, they ended up signing Julius Curry, a safety out of Michigan, four, four guy, punt returner. I fought for you hard. The, I couldn't get you an undrafted free agent opportunity. The only thing I could get you was a mini camp tryout. So we have a mini camp tryout. We have a mini camp this weekend. We'll fly you in. We'll pick you up. We'll bring you to mini camp. If you get hurt, it's on you, right? You sign a waiver. It's on you, but it's an opportunity. So I call my agent. This is what the Bears just called me with, and he's like, "You can't do that. Like if you tear your ACL, your career is over. You have to pay for this. Like you're it's tw- you, twenty grand. Like yeah, you, you you're can't paid do for it, right? shit. And I'm like. I'm walking around with that thing. At that right, right. I'm like, I have, I have literally nothing to lose, right? Yeah. Nothing to lose at all. So I go out, I go out to mini camp the morning. So it's like, we get there Thursday, uh, two practices Friday, two practices Saturday, one practice Sunday before that Sunday practice, they take me upstairs. Hey man, you've done a great job. We want to sign you to a three year deal, which is basically like rookie contract. Right. Almost. Like it's yeah. no, nothing guaranteed at all. No right. signing bonus. Like, but you're, you're making league minimum. You're going to get to come back here in three weeks and work out in the off season and you'll be there for training camp. Cool. Cause I came out here with nothing. That's what right? I'm saying. There's nothing at all. So I was like, yep, let me sign right here. Let's go. So 
you know, went out there, accomplished that goal, went back out for the summer, worked out with the Bears all off season, went to training camp as the sixth safety. <clears throat> Took me like a week and a half to jump over the fifth safety, who was the undrafted free agent from Michigan that they had signed, just because, you know, I, I was there with a single mindset, period. Like the, the only thing I can control is every time I'm on the football field, I'm going to impress somebody, right. whether it's with execution, whether it's making a play, whether it's with effort, like yep. everything that I can control, I'm going to put everything that I have into that. And I did. First preseason game, I'm on the sidelines for the first three quarters. I get no snaps. Nothing. Fourth quarter starts, go in, make like four tackles in the fourth quarter, but I'm ready, right? Yeah, like yeah. the lights are on and I'm flying around. So the next day we're watching film, my buddy Todd, who's a really good friend of mine now, Todd Johnson, he was a fourth round pick from Florida. We were rookies at the same time. He was yeah. a free safety. The last play he was in, the last play of the third quarter was a punt. He got crack backed and broke his jaw. So he breaks his jaw. He's out for six weeks. So all those reps that he was getting as the number two free safety are now my reps is the number two free safety because in that fourth quarter, you, I was flying around like a jumped, madman, you right? You jumped from five to th what, three at yeah, a time? Yeah, I was getting third team reps, maybe a couple of reps right, out right, of right. 10, right? And, and and Todd's the fourth round draft pick. They have plans for him. So he's, now you're, he's out. But now you're the two. Yeah. And now real quick. So now I'm backing up Mike Brown. Yeah. Right, who's a, a Pro Bowl safety. So yeah, from from no reps until the fourth quarter, and just circumstances dictated that like I had an opportunity. I'm starting on all the special teams, the second preseason game. I'm getting, you know, two and a half quarters worth of reps and I ball out. John Baxter had me so prepared to go into the NFL as a special teams player. So prepared. Have a great game two, game three. We're getting on the plane to go to New England to play our last preseason game. Right. Yeah. Suit, bag, everything. Jerry Angelo, the GM, pulls me into a trainer's room and said, Cam, you've done such a great job this preseason. We just don't have enough room on the roster for you. But we're going to cut you, but we want to sign you to the practice squad. Right Now, another team can claim you, can pick you up on waivers. They have every right to do that. But if not, we would love to sign you. It's a negotiation. You can make the same as a rookie on the active roster. Literally, as I'm getting onto the plane to go to New England, yeah. the day before our last game, <clears throat> so I'm like, mm, I have four quarters to ball. Yeah, I'm gonna ball, right? Somebody's gonna watch this tape and think that I, I can that play guy. for them, right? Right. So, I end up with like 14 tackles. I scoop a fumble, take it to the house, <laughs> like just like like it's almost a storybook, yeah. a storybook game. <clears throat> but the GM just told me I'm getting cut, right? So that was Friday. Cuts are on Sunday. So I'm sitting in my apartment in Chicago all day Sunday just waiting to, yeah. to get a call, to get called into the Bears office. You know, hey, we cut you, but we want to re-sign you. Never got a call. Turn the radio on. This is how old it was, 2003, right? Turn the radio on. Two o'clock was like the time that cuts had to be made and official. Turn the radio on and they list off the Bears cuts. And I was not was not a part of the was not a part of the cuts Dude. i made the made the 53 man roster you know as a as a, the only one that season to make it as an undrafted free agent that yeah so fucking bold. yeah that's yeah. such some stuff it's crazy i i've interviewed enough nfl dudes who have been cut and they, they call him the grim reaper and to hear and, and honestly it's one of my i i face adversity in the sports world so i understand like the highs the lows the the, the moments that people don't see it's a business at the end of the day yeah college football is a bit high school football's become a business man <laughs> i mean shit's crazy these days but i will say this and people don't they don't realize it like they just see it on twitter now it's like oh so and so got cut it's like but this dude just got fired from his job like yeah, this is a grown-ass right. man just got fired from his job yeah and sometimes yeah 10 minutes later they sign you on the p squad or this other then every but like hey some of my best friends like my kind of area guys they're kind of going through right now of they've been in the league they've had blurts of success here and there you get cut you're like oh, i'm gonna get picked up next week is my phone dead what the fuck's going on here yeah yeah and and i've i you know i support them i i i love them i want to reach out to them, be supportive whatever i can do be an asset 
And I and I want to set it up to where once they are done playing football, and we'll get into this later, um, what's next? What's the plan? How are you going to take that same mindset and attack it? But for the time being, it's like, dude, that's a mental, dude, do I have a job? And it, and I think this isn't talked about either. Like, I'm not checking anyone's <laughs> pockets, but not only do you have a job, but are you making, especially in today's era, like on P Squad, what's a P Squad making player making today? Like 15 G's a week, 7 G's a week, 10, 20 mm, G's yeah, a week? Yeah, I don't know. I have no it's, idea. It's at least, I know it's at least $7,000 a week. There are very few jobs in the United States Will you, unless you're a commission based like realtor yeah. or something, not at like 23, 24, 25 years old, like those jobs don't exist. Bro, seven in the real world. I tell these guys all the time, I'm FaceTime, I'm like, I'm in an onion field right now. It's, I woke up at fucking two today, I smell like shit, and I'm making like $280, and after taxes, probably like $206. It's stay in the league, bro. Yeah, yeah. Go be on Peace Squad. Like, grind it out. But I do want them to have the opportunity to, you know, once you're done, have the uh, – set yourselves up to put in a position to be successful, essentially, yeah. is what I'm saying. Before we get into all the, the NFL shit, I got a quick shout-out to our friends at Prize Picks. Uh, with Prize Picks reboot policy, your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For NFL games and college football top 25 matchups, if you have a player who exists exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, the player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with this insurance. Uh, I had a few prize picks hit this last week. They were absolutely electric. We need Fresno State on prize picks more often. I have I got some intel that I think I could definitely have some competitive advantages on. Tomorrow, or uh, I'm sorry, this Thursday night football game coming up, I have a few great ones. I think Justin Fields on the pass yards, he's more or less at 193. I think it's his revenge game. He's going to go more than 193, as well as passing, rushing, or receiving touchdown, Justin Fields at 1.5. Again, I think he's going to take the more. And I'm going to also put it with that entry, Brian Robinson Jr. Yep, that is many men, many, 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 many men. Uh, over 0.5 touchdowns, anytime score, more, hammer it. Could I be more excited? Uh, that is $20. That'll pay you 100 I don't know what else you want, guys. I don't know what else you want. Prize picks, go to prizepicks.com forward slash juice and use code juice for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Cam, I know we can't talk about gambling too much, but at the same time, uh, I think if Fresno State was featured on this app, I would I would do very well. I would do very well. Yeah. That insider knowledge would be really good <laughs> would be really good to to make some Fresno it'd State. It'd be like bets, no doubt. It'd be like well, the thing is it'd be hard because like Right now, they're on pace where every wide receiver's kind of like had, like, EB's had his games. Jalen had his game. Gill's last game. Mac Delaney, step it up, buddy. Come on, man. You're due. I think it's the Wyoming game. He's a little sick right now. I told him, I just FaceTimed him. I was like, flu game, MJ style. Yeah, yeah. It's time. Big game, rise yep. to the occasion. Um, yeah, when you're sick, when you get into that zone, it's just automatic. Dude, he's locked like, in. You don't right even now. have to think about it. It's locked just in automatic. Now. That's good. I, lo- I love it. So, all right, so let's just talk, you know, first of all, that story's fucking awesome. Yeah, thanks. Going to a Bears game soon. Might need to buy a Camwell jersey. I'm sure they're in the in, in the yeah. shop and everything. Yeah. Talk to me about just, you know, the uh, concept of making that roster and owning your role, the importance of special teams. And I know that uh, John Baxter, who my brother has said nothing but good things about, and, you know, as his, rec- has re- his receiver career continues to blossom – He's made a name for himself on special teams. Mm-hmm. I told him as an older brother who was a walk on, like, this is when well, you're a freshman, it's how you get on the bus, it's how you get it recognized. Totally. And, and nobody really realizes it, especially if you played high school ball. Like, nobody really cares about special teams in high school necessarily. Right. You get to college, <laughs> it's the biggest thing in the world all of a sudden. And I think, uh, especially talking to guys in the league, it could really help you. And if you don't play them, it could very much hurt you. Yeah. Tell me special teams in your eyes. Just what it means to an NFL player. I mean, if you're not a starter in the NFL, you better be able to play special teams because right. if you can't, like your game day active 
spot on the roster may go to somebody else. You know, right. if you're a third receiver, obviously you're going to be on. If you're a fourth receiver now, probably. If you're a third corner, you'll probably be on the side. But if you don't play special teams, those those active game day spots are limited. Right. I literally, the first four years of my career, I mean, year one, special teams work. Year two, they told me straight up, the reason you're on this roster is because of your special teams work. Every year, the impact that I made on special teams allowed me to have a roster spot, be active on game day, and then when opportunities presented themselves defensively, I took advantage of, the, of those opportunities. What was crazy to me, I knew John Baxter, one, John Baxter's crazy, right? He's crazy. <laughs> he is, he's crazy, yeah. right? And he'll tell you that himself, but he's a genius. Yeah. Like nobody, he, he and Keith Armstrong, who's still, who's still in the NFL, one of the best of, in the business, Nobody has ever broken down special teams the way that John Baxter breaks special teams down. It's so simple, but if you pay attention and you implement what he teaches you on the football field, like you're going to be successful, whether it's special teams or playing defense, right? Using angles to your advantage, when to beat blocks, how close you are to the returner, when you go front side or back side, like all of these things that I thought was common knowledge. When I got to the NFL, nobody knew that. Yeah. Nobody had an understanding of special teams the way that I understood special teams. The flying 40, get going as fast as you can right as the kickoff is kicked because you're running faster than everybody else. Time it up perfectly. We worked on that countless times at Fresno State. You can't do it anymore. You have to be like within two yards yeah. of the ball. But back then, I was flying down the field because I understood how to reach perfect. full speed when the ball was being kicked. So all of these things that we were taught that I just thought everybody understands this, guys from the SEC, guys from the Pac-12, guys from the Big Ten had no concept of how to be successful playing special teams. And that's honestly why I establish myself as an NFL player. Like I made it as a special teamer my rookie year. I stayed in Chicago because of that and then created opportunities for myself defensively just because of that special teams work. As the NFL in in, in well, let me backtrack real quick. If you had to pinpoint your top moment in the league, you're like, holy shit, fire me the fuck up. <laughs> Could you? Do you have a moment? Yeah, I mean, we won the NFC Championship when I was in Chicago. Right. <clears throat> it was um, I mean, the, one of the greatest nights that I've ever experienced. I, I mean, we're, we're at home. We're the number one seed. Drew Brees and Reggie Bush come into Soldier Field. It's close for a little while. Reggie Bush breaks on like 85 and then flips into the end zone, and it, it was a route after that. Like We routed him. I've never seen Brian Urlacher as intense – as walking off the field after Reggie Bush flips into the end zone in Soldier Field, he's like, it's over, man. It's over. And we routed him. 39-17. I mean, it, snow starts coming down in the fourth quarter. Thomas Jones break one. It's The game's a wrap, right? Snow starts coming down. We're like, yeah, we're going to the Super Bowl, yeah. man. We're going to <laughs> this. Is, this is so great, right? Yeah. We've been building for this. We believed in this all off season, all during this magical season, 13 and three, number one seed, all that. All my family were there. We went to dinner afterwards, like 15 of us in a private room at Capitol Grills. I mean, it was like the greatest night ever. We go, Brian Urlacher throws a party afterwards. The whole team is there. Family, every, like my mom's partying with Brian Urlacher. I mean, that's yeah. that's the type of night that we had. It, it was, I mean, it was almost magical. You know, that that was it. I mean, it was we had built that for four years up right. to that point, And finally, you know, we were going to the Super Bowl. How, what, how, what, talk to me about Brian Urlacher real quick at like elevator pitch stocks. I'm sure you could go on and on, but like, how is Brian Urlacher? He's one of, he's like one of the greatest dudes you'll ever meet. Yeah. I mean, you would never know that he's a first ballot mm -hmm. hall of famer, right. NFL defensive player of the year, treats everybody the same is open. We were at his house countless times, you know, playing cards, playing paintball like he's just he was he's just a dude man he's a good dude 
small town uh, new mexico yeah ex- you know lobos <laughs> yeah in- insanely talented 64 260 could run like anybody like just off the charts as a football player never played with anybody who could do the things that that dude did on a football field and it's in- it's inspiring no he's inspiring. no more of an intense person ever on the field than Brian Urlacher, man. Like wow. the things that he would say to officials, like during a game. Crazy. The first time I was on the field with them playing defense and I heard him talk to an official, I was like, what is going on? I go off to the sideline and I'm like, man, have you ever heard Lack talk to the officials? They're like, yeah, right? How does he get away with that? I'm like, I don't know, man, because I've never heard anybody <laughs> talk to an official like that. But sure enough, you know, they know it's Brian Urlacher, man. He can do what he wants. I have a big board list uh, of guys, I'm like, okay, these guys, they're athletes who like, they definitely bring the juice. <laughs> and Brian Erector's like four on the totem pole yeah, yeah. of someday cross paths with him, be like, hey man, can I borrow 45 minutes of your time? <laughs> I'll, I, whatever you need, I got, I got, I'll get you some hats, get you whatever you need, man. Like, I know you're bringing the juice. I'd love to hear your perspective on like, just mindset and yeah. life and shit. And, <laughs> Just how like we're doing here, Cam, and like that's awesome that you got to you know do that shit. But what out of all that NFL stuff, eventually it comes to an end. When did you know your your playing days were over? And talk to me about that transition of NFL player into the real world. What was your journey like? Yeah, it was tough, man. Uh, <clears throat> so went to Miami as a free agent after Chicago after the Super Bowl season. Decided to leave, could have resigned, wanted some opportunities to play more. Ended up starting like half of the year, tore my ACL, rehab, signed with the Jets, <clears throat> blew my shoulder out for the second time, rehabbed, ended up signing back with Chicago at the end of 2008. <clears throat> Played the last game of the season, we lost, would have went to the playoffs if we beat the Texans, who are not good. Um, but I was a free agent in March, you know, working i was in fantastic shape all that 2009 year um so so 2008 was your last year playing but 2009 you were still working out right so two, ready right 2008 and i talked to the bears like this you know i'll sign a minimum i don't just give me an opportunity i don't right, you right. know i know i know what i can do so just give me in training camp and i'll make things happen nothing nothing some guys are getting workouts i'm not getting workouts so like august september training camp ends I have buddies who are getting workout safeties who I'm on the same level with special teams, guys, backups, like they're sure. signing, they're getting workouts and I'm not. So I'm like, all right, this is, it's over. Yeah. Right. So October, right around October, 2009, I'm like, all right, this is, this is it for me. I'm not going to keep chasing this thing. I'm not going to go play in the CFL or UFL or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but really no plan at all. Like none. August, uh, October, like okay i have two young kids i have no idea what i'm gonna do you know but i i i, I invested my money smartly Good. you know i had some time i had some time to figure it out and really didn't have a plan necessarily i met dave standerfer who's the owner of athletic performance just by happenstance i was doing some seven on seven yeah. stuff putting on some tournaments uh, at the time a company called passing down so i was already kind of doing some stuff uh, right. But I met Dave. He wanted to sponsor uh, Passing Down. I, we just kind of hit it off. Right. And um, yeah, we've had Dave on. Yeah. 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 Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Dave, we had Dave and Josh on. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, right. So, so, you know, I became a partner in athletic performance way back in two, early 2010, where we were out Growing. by the, we were out by the airport. Yeah. Oh, you know, deep. like, yeah. like small 1900s. 2010? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, that. I, I went there. <laughs> In like sophomore high school. Anyways, continue. Yeah, so out by the airport, you know, partnered partnered with Dave, and we were there for about eight months. We, I mean, we doubled, tripled in size, moved over off of of Herndon, and then there for about a year, and then moved to the place on Clovis, which right. uh, Athletic Performance has has been at for man, it's been eleven years now. Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of I just kind of jumped right into it. Didn't know anything about business. Didn't have a business background. Um, just kind of jumped into that coached a couple years at Fresno city, which may, I thought about getting into coaching, but I had two young daughters. I didn't want to, I had friends who were doing it. They were bouncing all over the country. Didn't want to do that. Yeah. Uh, and it's then a tough life, man, it's, you know, and great opportunities, but you're like, I mean, you're I had buddies it. who were Washington, 
San Diego, Detroit, like not, you know, Fresno to Chowchilla, not those moves, like oh. all the way across the country, uprooting your family and moving them somewhere else. Yep. I just didn't want to do that. So got into broadcasting, was ESPN got the rights to Fresno State and then got in the booth with Paul Leffler and you know, the rest of that has kind of been history. Pat Hill came two years later, kicked me down to the sideline, which has been, I mean, that working with Pat and, and Paul has been absolutely fantastic. Right. Uh, and then got into sales. Like I had a buddy who had a startup doing some soft shell football equipment. Right. Got into sales about 2015, worked for AstroTurf for three years, selling turf. Now work for a, a construction company, the Kaya Group doing sales but you know i had no plan yeah went finished my sociology degree from fresno state went back finished my mba congratulations or got an mba That's a couple awesome. years ago yeah which was a grind but um you know always something when i got into business i'm like i don't know anything about business i need to know about business right well get an mba you you understand business so you know that was a, a priority for me so so i've gone back and, and done that but you know that <clears throat> that transition period man it's it nobody really there's no blueprint no there's not you're you're around 53 guys with a similar mindset every single day who are working towards a goal and then that's gone it's that support tough. system that emotional support system that structure goal support yes yeah, stru all of it it's tough. all it's all gone yeah, no. you know and now you're on your own uh, nobody's showing up because there's no game on Sunday, right? And it's not that they don't still love you, but it's just different. It is different. It's very much different. <clears throat> it's not, it's it's hard in a lot of ways, I think, because, you know, mentally you're used, for me, for the guys that I've talked to, structure is one of the biggest ones. I like being told I need to be up at 5.52 <laughs> so I could be somewhere at 6.30. And I'm, I got, and 6.30 means I'm, I'm there at 6:20 because that's on. Because if you're not early, you're late basically. Right. right. And uh, continuing with that, this is like like you said, like-minded individuals. You don't realize you're operating at this high-ass level right. until you get out in the normal world. And you're kind of <laughs> just like, this is all I got to do, and yeah. I and like, and, and you got to you got to go through this phase of not becoming complacent, almost of letting yourself go down to a certain level. And I think that's one of the things that drove me to, to, to do bring the juice in the first place, just in the sense of I want to take that same mindset that got my experience of athletics as far as I did. Okay, great. I don't got cool stories like you do for the Chicago Bears and shit like that. But I, but I, I think there's a bridge there where a high-level athlete operates at a certain type of, of, of intensity that can be translated to the business world to the professional world, to whatever the fuck. If you flip burgers at McDonald's, it doesn't matter. Right. You could be the best burger flipper at McDonald's history right. if you really want to do it, you right. know? And that's easy to say in a sentence, you know, on, a, on the fucking Bring the Juice podcast. But it's hard to live day in and day out and understand, you know, things aren't always easy. And when you're an <laughs> athlete, it's, it's, why are you pissed off? Why do you go to bed? crying or why are you in the shower just like wanting to just drown like what what's going on and then it's usually injuries playing time not going your way coaches on your ass things aren't working out you're you know missing tackles dropping the ball whatever the whatever it is well when you're just a, when you're just a grown-ass man it's like is my family happy am i bringing in enough money to provide for them mm -hmm. am i healthy like I want to be? Am I doing what I can to be the best version of myself right. and hold myself accountable? And it's it's just not that easy. Like it should be, but it really life happens. Shit yeah. gets thrown your way. You start, you know, taking a couple couple steps off of working out as hard or or holding yourself to a, a high level, a high standard. And before you know it, you could be spiraling downhill. And like Kim, I got some buddies who and, and, and I, I do value the mindset and the principles you learn of playing. Again, I didn't play in the NFL, so I say college football. If you went through five years of college football, you know how to show up somewhere on time. You know what it takes to contribute to help a team win. Mm -hmm. You know what it takes to <clears throat> uphold a standard. Like These are things where if you're trying to work for a company, start your own company, it's going to help you be successful. No doubt. But there's some... There's, there's, there's guys, there's people out there and 
to where it just kind of goes in one year out the other and i'm like dude you just you just were on billboards for fresno state five years ago like why are you playing video games in your girlfriend's you know guest bedroom because she doesn't want to see you right now what's going on and no call outs here no call outs here but seriously it's one of those things where it's like how can i translate that so i guess what i would ask is did you have any traits early on that you had in football that translated over to kicking ass in your business ventures and so on and so forth I mean, yeah, probably, you know, I was, I was not highly recruited. I, if I earned anything here at Fresno state or in the NFL, it was because I absolutely earned it every single bit of it. So there's an aspect of that's just the way that I operated at that point, because that's, that's just what I knew. And I think God for Zach Thomas, the one year that I played in Miami, because I was a starter that year and I prepared the first game I ever started against the Houston Texans. I prepared all week long. I played really well. And then I got benched, even though I played really well. And everybody told me I played really well. Donovan Darius, the veteran safety that we had signed is going to start. And it took one series against the Browns. And they're like, all right, Cam, get back in. Right. But I was not prepared. Right. And I'll, I'll never forget this to the day. I'm in there like second series. I, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand what how Cleveland's trying to attack us. Three receivers set, two backs. Receiver comes in motion. I'm thinking I'm the down force player. This receiver's going to crack me. They're going to run the ball right at me. Play action fake. Hit me with the touchdown right in behind me. Curl route right in behind me because I'm flying up on the run. I'm running off the field, and Zach Thomas says, bro, when it's three receivers and two backs, it's like 80% pass. Like, why are you flying downhill on the play action fake? And I was like... Hold up, man. I played four years in Chicago, but we played cover two, right? So right. you are only going to be attacked certain ways, and you know what those ways are. If our front four can get to the quarterback before those routes develop, they hit the check down, we tackle it, we get off the football field. So I had never really had a process to study yeah. what an opponent does. Mm. So Monday, I'm like, Zach, I'm going to sit with you all week long, and I want to know your process for studying so I can recall what you recalled on Sunday with that personnel grouping and formation. And sure enough, I sat with them all week long and developed a process of how to study tape to, you know, I was not the most athletic person on the field. So I needed to know these are the two or three things that this team's going to do out of this personnel grouping down a distance and formation, yeah. right? So having that process in place, it, it, it allowed me to understand football at such a depth that I want to understand everything that I do at the same depth. So I had that kind of natural curiosity. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to be the best at it because I'm going to study what it takes to be the best at it. I'm going to be the most prepared to advantage. do it. Right. Yep. Like, and so that's what I really took from the NFL and that's what I brought. It just, it was a learning curve. I was, you know, I was like 29 years old, 30 years old, didn't really know how to communicate that well to people. So that was a skill that I had to learn. And what I really figured out, like we're different, right? High level athletes are just different. Like we're, we're wired differently. We're, our intensity is different. Our standard of operating is different. Like I've gotten into some corporate structures that like that's frowned upon. Yeah. That's thought as this guy's a little bit crazy. Like I'm not yeah. I'm not crazy. I'm just I'm trying to do the best I can and I'm trying to win. I'm trying, I'm to, trying win. to win. You're not trying to win. You exactly. think you are, but you're absolutely you're not. not trying to win. And it so, comes off as intense and you're just like sorry. Right. Man. And like so I I go off sometimes. People are like, You okay? Like, no, I'm not okay. I'm trying yeah. to win and you're not. You yeah. don't understand it. Yeah. So that that also like a learning curve, man. I've I, I've never lost that, right? I've never lost that intensity. If I'm doing something, I want to be the absolute best at it. And I think my football career, being an athlete, having to fight and scratch and claw for everything that I ever got at the highest level, it's it's just kind of part of me now. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And like, I, I I see that, and I preached it. I we posted a clip yesterday or some shit. I was like, hire former athletes they will help your company totally man. they will totally. I, I don't care what their degree is blah 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 if they went through five years of college if they went through five fall camps they know how to be accountable at some degree yeah if they could still prove that they can 
they have some value totally but i and i agree with you because you are wired different like i mean i remember when i first finished i was just like i'm gonna read i didn't read a book from like sixth grade i think my last book was like (laughs) hunger games right didn't read a fucking book all of a sudden i got this long ass drive to kettleman city back to madera every day hour drive at least I'm reading, I'm listening to audiobooks yeah. and I'm just, I'm listening to Navy SEAL mindsets, which I was seriously contemplating about becoming a SEAL at some point if this shit didn't work out. It, why? Because they're, they're badass motherfuckers who compete to be yep. the best. And yep. I love that type of shit. I love it. And you just kind of start realizing like, okay, I'm wired, you are wired a little differently. Yep. And then you start translating like, okay, I need to provide for my money. We live in, I mean, for my family, we live in California. I need to make some fucking money. <laughs> I need to figure it out. I got to get creative here. I need, yep. you read like rich dad, poor dad. I was like, I need multiple sources of passive income yep. and all this bullshit. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, all right, what's next? Googling ways to make money fast. Yep. <laughs> like, okay, this is cool. And, but with all that, like you get this drive and this demeanor and you know, you met my wife, like she knows I have notebooks next to my bed in my truck constantly. Not even notebooks. It could be a back of a napkin, an envelope. I don't care. I will write down ideas and my biggest supporters and my biggest haters are both the same people. It's my family. But everyone thinks I'm crazy for this idea or some, you know, knowledge of, or what if I did this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, that's crazy. I was like, but what if it hits? What if we fuck around and hit it though? In every book you read, every story about anything and you, you, You've been involved with plenty of businesses to know, like, it takes some balls and risk to make shit happen. Totally. It just does. Totally. And I think with sports, like you say, like, you got to just double down on yourself. You got to bet, say, you know what, man? Yeah, there's a lot of shit not going my way. And if you had to ask somebody who doesn't think like you, they'd be like, I don't know if that's a good move, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but you find a winner who, lets their nuts hang pretty much they'll be like fucking send it bro go for that shit now now be calculated right because especially kid you played safety like the worst kind of safety to be i played safety after high school you don't want to just be blindly running downhill like a torpedo right you gotta watch the double move you gotta watch a lot of shit right (laughs) so i think controlled chaos controlled intensity con it is the secret recipe of being like, this is my jet fuel to put my rocket ship jet pack on and just go to the fucking moon yeah. on whatever venture it might be. And again, that is a lot of things much easier said than done. <laughs> but I, I relate to you a lot and we're just, we're not normal. Like things are intense, man. I told my family I want to throw a fucking boxing match at Table Mountain Casino. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, I don't know. I think it's a good event. I think it'd be profitable for our nonprofit. Um, I think there's some good things there. I think we could bring in a crowd. Okay. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Guess what, man? They loved it. They had a great time. Yeah. Everyone had a good time. Yeah. And it's like now, but I can't sit still. I told myself, I'm not going to throw an event for another year. I'm drawing up. I want to throw a rodeo. I <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of shit, man. But... When you can't sit still, I think it's not a bad thing. No, no, I'd rather be too intense and live life too hard than just be boring. Yes, totally. Yeah, I work my nine to five, clock in, clock out. My family goes to Disneyland once every five years. Like, fuck that, man. I want (laughs) to. I want to do some shit. Yeah. Hey, some 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 people, you know, some people have that that outlook on life. It's just never been mine. You know, it just it's it's not it's not the way that I'm wired. I probably do way too much. Like I take being a father extremely seriously. I put a ton of effort into my family, time, energy, emotions, 18 year old and 15 year old daughter. Like, wow. you know, it's, it takes a lot of just emotion. It's an emotional house that we live in just, just because, you know, um, and, and I've always supported them. I was at gymnastics today. It's just, it's a huge part of my life, but there's, like sitting around and, and being passive, it's just never, it's never fit me, man. It just hasn't. I've always wanted to do more. I'm, I'm curious on other things. And I think people try to put 
former athletes into a box, right? They try to define us and they try to make us fit what their concept of a former athlete is or what their concept of a successful person is. And I've kind of found like, I don't, I don't really fit a lot of boxes. I'm with the company now, the Kaya group. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Like they, they get it. There's a lot of similar mindsets. It's a growth oriented company. You can kind of do whatever you want. As long as you're successful, they don't care, you know, take care of people and, and, it's hard to find those places that allow right. you to just grow and be yourself because man, it's so threatening to a lot of people that threatening. They, they can't handle it. Exactly. And especially if you come in there like a bull in a China shop where you're just like, <laughs> they're like, Oh, I got my degree in this and I got 15 years in this, this field. And there's value to that. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. But it's like, listen, at the end of the day, you're either a winner or you're not. <laughs> and either way you're going to, maybe I don't know this field yet, but like, I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. I'm going to find a way like anything, especially in sports, best way to learn. You make a mistake. You learn from it. You don't do it again. Maybe you get burnt twice. Okay. I know now. Yeah. All right. Now the higher up you get, the margin for error is razor thin. You, yeah. You know, you're, if you, if you were, if you were an undrafted free agent at that mini camp and you got, you know, Randy Moss caught four balls on you. It's like, all right, bro. You know, yeah. It's I, luckily I was a well-established veteran before oh, Randy go. Moss <laughs> dunked on me a couple of times when I was in Miami. Ooh, but but yeah, like yeah, you your your margin for error is is smaller. The more established you are, the the more room for error you may have. But man, the more impactful your decisions are, and the the more yeah. negative you know effects could come from those. But it's, it's been a it's been a cool journey, man. I I can't playing for Pat Hill and John Baxter and Kevin Coyle and JD with all the coaches that were here. And then Lovey Smith, Dom Capers was such a huge, you know, imparted so much to me as a defensive mind, all these, all these teachers that were focused on football. Yeah. Taught me so much more about life than, than football because of the way they taught football because of their passion, because of their attention to detail and I've taken that and I've applied it to every single aspect of my life. Like I was a pretty good football player. Um, you know, I'm trying to be better as a businessman. I'm trying to be better as a father, as a husband, yes. as a supporter of the Central Valley. Like I'm trying to take all of those lessons and impart them into every single aspect of my life. Take the elite mindset to chase greatness. I couldn't agree more. Before my last question, I got a quick shout out to our friends at American Pistachio Growers. If you want to perform like the pros, eat your pistachios, eat those nuts, kids. Um, yeah, was that your car? I, I don't know, dude. I started here. Is there a that. horn going off, dude? I was like, oh shit. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. At the at the college game day we did on Saturday, uh, I had Marcus on the set, and everyone behind us started going like Marcus. They're like. Do this emotion, and I'm looking, and I'm kind of like trying to keep the the show going, and I'm like, and I'm like trying to read these sign languages for these <laughs> random people, and then I'm like, I just I was like, what? They're like Marcus, your car is getting towed, and we turn back, and Marcus is Chrysler's on a tow truck. He gets, we got the, we got to clip that right. We got the whole thing on video. Marcus starts no sprinting way. down frat row over the thing. Is, oh my god, he texts me. He's like, yo. He's like, we're cool, bro. I'll be back in like five minutes for the next segment. <laughs> I'm like, jeez, man. Oh, man. Crazy. <clears throat> um, anyways, Cam, my last question. You know, we're both dogs guys, and I know you're very invested and close with the team right now, and I don't want to get into that, but with all the conference realignment, the NIL, the hoopla, we'll call it that for right now, what does Fresno State need to do to take the next step to become that that national brand almost? They need to pass number one. They need to pass the county tax. That's going to be on the ballot in March. The measure like, e. Me- measure it's, it's e, the only way. It's it really is the only way. It's the only like way. that the there's no possible way to immediately have three hundred million dollars available to put no. back into this athletic program just by giving one penny for every four dollars that you spend in Fresno County. I mean, an insignificant amount of you money know. you will not notice ever yes right how many people pick up a penny on the street right now it's dirty i mean yeah very few right one penny for every four dollars so number one if they pass measure e that allows them to put 
dollars into the infrastructure that is lacking right now on campus a football only facility in the stadium upgrade the stadium you know all of the things that they need to do right measure e is the ticket to do that and then private support will come on top of that but there's just not the central valley is not uh economically it's not economically viable to support $250 Two hundred fifty million dollars worth of projects. It's just not. It's just not going to happen. No, and I mean, I mean, Kim, like we've been involved in, uh, you know, Borg Foundation fundraisers, understanding the dynamic on the inside of that. NILs come up. There's Bulldog Bread. There's all these things. There's all these dynamics on how you could give money. And I think at the end of the day, all bullshit set aside, it needs to be known that you you do even if you have you could pay your guys an extra, you know two grand a month you got to get the infrastructure like you said totally like you you need you need the stadium and not just a city you need right now our cafeteria for the football team it is in is it three or four trailers put together behind the baseball field yeah. in the locker room <laughs> yeah don't get me wrong the chefs are awesome the food is delicious in there i actually miss friday morning omelet bar <laughs> ever so often i'm like <laughs> Mac, how are the almonds these days? <laughs> and, but like, dude, we're a ranked program. We, yeah. win, we win championships and bowl games, and we got alum in the NFL that are, you know, I mean, Devontae Adams, say what you want. We could debate all day. Devontae Adams is the best wide receiver in the NFL. Yeah. Like, say, yeah. Dude, talk to me about it, <laughs> but comment on this. But like, I, at the end of the day, it's like, what, what can be done? And I think it all starts there. And the only way it happens, it's not, it's not ten people donating fifty thousand dollars. That's not going to get the job done. That's great, but I don't think that's the long term answer. Something like Measure E, uh, not something. Measure E needs to pass essentially. Yeah. Uh, not an official ad here, but <laughs> but pretty much. And then, you know, on top of that, it's just it's just how how are, how are you going to do your part? You know, a Fresno City coach. I didn't, I didn't play at Fresno City, but he came and spoke to us one time, and he just said the term "do your one eleventh" when you're on the football field. And that stuck with me because it's like, they always say, do your job. Mm-hmm. Do your 111th. If everyone does their job, then do it. And I get there's people in the Valley who maybe they don't support Fresno State. They don't like what we're about. They don't like winning football programs and fun and <laughs> good degrees and all that crap. Right. But they, don't, they don't like degrees giving back to the Central Valley economically. Say, like, like, like 80% of the degrees that come I, from Fresno State give back to the Valley I economically. I mean, I've said this like multiple that. times. Without Fresno State, Fresno is not Fresno. And no. without Fresno State football, Fresno is just a shittier Bakersfield <laughs> at that point. Right? So, you got it. That's like, tough too, man. That's true. tough. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's a situation of just like, I, there is no right answer necessarily, but there is a wrong one. And the wrong one is, you got we got to keep growing. And, you know, through the Bulldog Foundation, I, as a young alum who is trying to save up money to go to nice dinners ever so often, is trying to pay off a house, has a car bill, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm adulting. I want to get back to Fresno State, but I don't have a $1,000 check to write right now. Yeah. I don't, right? But they created through the Bullock Foundation, now you could still give back. Of like, hey, I'm going to donate $10 a month, mm-hmm. $20 a month. $80 a month is $1,000 a year, almost, give or take, right? $80 a month, that's the equivalent of I mean, camp us going to get beers for two hours, right? So either don't go get beers for two hours, <laughs> or say, you know what, I could handle that in my adult life now. Yeah, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do an extra beer run, but I'm donating it to Fresno State. And I think there's a lot of creative ways you could go about it, get the community there. But I'm, uh, I don't know, man. I just, I want it to happen. Yeah, and, <clears> and I like, think we're there. I'm, I'm, you know, a penny for every four bucks to 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 grow not just the athletics, but to grow the academic side of Fresno, like Fresno State educational facilities are they're in that they're, they're as far behind other institutions as athletics is behind other high level institutions. It's just the way that it is, right? right? You don't get deferred maintenance money and you have to put these things off. The campus will benefit greatly. And I mean, you said it perfectly. The, Without Fresno State, the economy in Fresno is not nearly as vibrant as it is with Fresno State. 
Fresno State needs to continue to put infrastructure together to support the academic programs that are a huge part of the Central Valley. Absolutely. Without Fresno State, the Central Valley is not the Central Valley. There's no. agriculture. There's not a lot else. Fresno State brings all of this other economic activity to the Central Valley. So, I mean, obviously I'm biased. I played there. I love Fresno State, right? <laughs> I mean, I love Fresno State, but just from a from a community standpoint, Fresno State does so much outside of athletics. It does yes. so much outside of maybe the benefit that you or I see from it because the economy grows because of Fresno State alums. That grows the tax base. That helps the roads get repaired sure. when they need to get repaired. All of the economic activity that Fresno State spurs needs to be supported. And given a penny for every four bucks is not a lot to ask. What 80 bucks a month. A lot of people can't afford 80 bucks a month, I and I get it, right? I but get it. a penny for every $4 for the huge, the billion dollars that it will generate in yes. upgrades for Fresno State, man, it's, I just, I hope people support it. I hope they don't look at it as a tax and I'm against taxes. Like the Central Valley will be better yes. because Measure E passes. Yes, 100%. Cam, love this. Before I wrap it up. You've had a great story, great experience bringing all the juice. Anything you want to say to bring the juice before we wrap these up? Nah, man. I'm glad that we finally got to work this <gasps> out. We've been talking about it for so long. It took football season to, to make it all work out. But love what you're doing. Keep doing it. I think it's great. It's a great platform. Keep bringing dudes on and just you know letting them story. tell their story, talk about whatever they want to. I think the, the Valley loves it. Obviously, when you put on a public event, it goes so keep doing keep that going. man keep and keep and keep using the energy that you have to to do the things that you want to do man i think we had a good conversation about we don't fit in everybody's box and right. and that's it's sometimes okay. it's hard right sometimes it's, it, it makes you doubt where you are a little bit but if i've taken anything from like 40 almost 44 years of life it's like <laughs> you look great you know yeah <laughs> appreciate it it's just the best thing that you can do is be your authentic, genuine self all the time. It's hard. It's hard for me at 44 to be that all the time. But the more that you can give that to the world, the better this world's going to be. So keep keep doing what you're doing, man. Cam, I appreciate the kind words. Yeah. Guys, Cam Morrell, follow him on the gram. Listen to this episode. Unsubscribe, resubscribe, buy the merch, do it all. We'll see you at the dogs games. Get your piss hot. Fire me up. Bring the juice. And we will see you next week.